They used to sing the song, it won't be long before, and we'll be leaving here, but I, I don't think we're leaving. In fact, if I understood the parable that Jesus taught, the bad guys get taken first. Some people have never seen that. Um, but when, when Jesus said in the last days it would be like it was in the days of Noah, <laughs> and um, in the days of Noah, the ones who were taken away were taken away in judgment, and Noah was left with eight. One will be taken, one will be sleeping, and the other taken. Y'all ain't going nowhere. It's just too much to do. And you'll get bored in heaven if you can't do down here what they're doing up there. Amen. I have a little prayer I want to pray over you before I get started. Or as my brother once said, before I preach, I want to say something. Jim McCoy prayed this prayer in a Georgia turpentine camp, and I'm going to pray it over you, okay? So why don't you do your hands like this, just do your hands like that, just get ready to receive. Oh Lord, give your people today the eyes of an eagle, the wisdom of an owl. Connect their souls with the gospel telephone in the central skies. Illuminate their brow with the sun of heaven, turpentine their imagination. Grease their lips with possum oil. Loosen their tongues with the sledgehammer of your power. Electrify their brain with the lightning of your might. Put perpetual motion in their arms. Fill them plumb full of the dynamite of your glory. Anoint them all over with the kerosene of your salvation. And then, Lord, set them on fire. I believe God wants to set us on fire. I receive it. You ready for it? Yes, sir. I'm ready for it. Um, it's kind of nightclub-y here, so I need some lights. Because I need to know if there is a real audience out there. Somebody painted one. And, um, and you can't read your Bible in the dark anyway. good for worship, you know, when you're doing that, but when you're getting ready to be enlightened, you need light to be enlightened. Bring your greetings from the city where God lives. We asked him to come. We told him that we wanted Pittsburgh to be more famous for God than for steel, and so he got rid of the steel industry. And now we're careful to say we say stealers, um, but if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. Uh, I'm going to celebrate the, the young women who were dancing uh, this evening. You guys are just absolutely amazing, just so, so amazing. several moves that they made that they had sort of a Pentecostal Church of God in Christ feel to it when they were doing the, the little dance, but uh, there's one part of my knee that says, don't you dare, man, don't you dare. So, but when you have people who can rejoice when it's a season of rejoicing and they are skilled at it, the Bible talks about skilled music. 
musicians, skilled worshipers, skilled dancers, and those young ladies are skilled, and I just so appreciate them. Would you just celebrate God's gift to the church? And, and, um, and then at one point, there was just this cute little baby waving her banner. And I just said, okay, God, that's what it takes. Clarence and I have, uh, we've been touching various things in God and our church, and it's just been an amazing season for us in um, learning what to say at, at the right time. And uh, we've, been, we've been focusing on, on the Lord's Prayer. Um, it's just one of those, those messages that you, you share and it starts to take hold in your heart and in your spirit. And, um, and when Jesus was praying, Luke says, when he was praying and when he finished, one of his disciples asked him, would you teach us to pray like John taught his disciples? And so Jesus goes on to teach them how to pray. Thank you. Is this one better? How about this one? I had the one with the red on it. The lady in the red gave me the red. We get to travel a lot, and um, and when you go to certain countries, there are words that are acceptable in America that aren't acceptable in other places, and so you walk a fine line, you know, when you're telling things, and and um, and so we're trying to learn how to say right things in the right place. But people love to hear words in their own language, and uh, Clarence and I were. Uh, She says, well, you're calling your wife um, a boy. And so uh, he had to fix that up. I was, in, uh, I was in South Africa, and I was talking about worship. And I said, um, when you're in worship, your head is down. And um, I can't, I, I, I won't say the word, but uh, when I said your head is down and your, your rear is up, I had another word that I used for rear. I kept saying it, so finally one of the ladies came to me, she says, uh, in America, that's probably a good word, but here in England, that's not, in South Africa, in England, that's not a good word, and, and now I'm trying to figure out, okay, how many words can I not say here, um, and I thought of this story I heard, a, a bird pathologist was examining the remains of crows that had been killed, and to everyone's relief, he confirmed the problem that it was probably not avian flu cause of death appeared to be vehicular impacts. However, during the detailed analysis, it was noted that varying colors of paints appeared on the bird's beaks and claws. By analyzing these paint residues, it was determined that 98% of the crows had been killed by impact with trucks, while only 2% were killed by an impact with a car. MTA then hired an ornithological behaviorist to determine if there was a cause for the disproportionate percentages of trucks, kills versus car kills. He quickly concluded the cause. When crows eat roadkill, they always have a lookout crow in a nearby tree to warn of impending danger. They discovered that while all the lookout crows could shout, Ka! Not a single one could say truck. So, because the preacher was wise, he sought acceptable words. So I'm going to see if I can find some acceptable words for us tonight. Would you uh, join the hand of the person next to you just one more time? And this is the last time I'll ask you to do it. Um, you don't want to do it. You don't have to. But then you probably ought to go home if you don't want to do that. Uh, 
Father, we thank you for this amazing assembly of worshipers who, who have come and who have disported themselves before you, rejoicing in your goodness and in your mercy and the call to come up higher. Lord, I thank you for the heart that you've given us to worship you, to be open to everything that you're calling us to do. And some of it, we don't even know what it is, but, but because you're such a good God, it's easy for us to say yes and thank you. So speak your word. Release us to be your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. And the rest of you, This was about a month in August, right? You were on vacation in August. In August, we had a team of um, people come to our church from, from London and um, the Catch the Fire Church in London, and they were, they were so sweet and so wonderful, so passionate, loved God, and so gentle in their ministry and so mean in, in their ministry. They, they, they did really nice things, but they hurt you a lot. But at the end of the day, um, our lives were changed. And, and how God changes your lives is an amazing thing because you, you don't suspect that he's going to do what he does the way he does it. And, and, um, and I've heard someone refer to him as Jehovah Sneak. dealing with a certain aspect of, um, of, of ministry need in, in our lives. And a lot of us are familiar with the term the father wound, but many of us weren't familiar with the term the mother wound. And the thing that I said to our, our leaders and the people who were participating in this ministry time, I said, I said, I know you're going to say, well, I've already done forgiveness and I've already done deliverance and I've done all of that and I've renounced all of this. And I said, what happens to us? We approach the Bible as though we know it all. We approach ministry as though we know it all. And so if I quote a passage of scripture like, uh, I'm going to be preaching from John 3.16. Well, you're, you're going to say, oh, everybody knows John 3.16. Give me something deep. As though there isn't anything deep in John 3.16. And I said, what you have to do in order to be a student of the word, you have to approach the word each time as though you've never heard it before. And so I share with them an experience that I had when I was, uh, I was being trained to operate computers. And the guy was just going a little bit further than he needed to go because he was trying to tell us how the computer on the inside how it managed data with bits and bytes, B-Y-T-E-S, B-I-T-S, bits and bytes, and how those, those mechanical things were taking place. And he was, he was explaining to us to his satisfaction. We were looking at him like a tree full of owls. I mean, we just, were just staring at this guy. And, and so, and, and the other thing that was suspicious to me was because I knew that during the breaks he would go and smoke a joint. And so I figured, I don't know if he's talking or if the dope is talking. And so it was going on like that. And so fun, he looked at us and he said these words, people, this works. I need you to suspend your skepticism. And that phrase came back to me as, as we launched into this ministry time. I said, some of you've done ministry, a lot of the things that these people are doing, uh, you need to suspend your skepticism. Start approaching. Look, God, I don't know what they're going to say, but I know you're going to say something to me, and I'm going to suspend my skepticism. And a lot of people got healed just because of that. And I remember a moment when he was asking us to deal with the issues concerning our mothers. My mom 
When my father died, she was left with five kids, and the youngest wasn't even a year old. And um, she's about, she was about five, about five ten. Um, she hit for distance. When my mother disciplined me, it was serious. Today she would go to jail. <laughs> but because she did, I'm not in jail. And uh, it made the difference. But when we were, we were trying to deal with some of the things that were taking place, and my, my mom was such a beautiful person, but when I, when I was praying about anything concerning my mom, it dawned on me that as I was growing up, I would ask my mother for things, and she would, she would say, you don't need that, and I would prevail on her. And then finally she would come through with it, and, and I'm talking about on welfare, working, she's a working mom. I mean, it was like, we were poor. We didn't know we were poor. I didn't know I was poor until I went to Howard University. And uh, learn poor words like uh, marginalized and dis, you know, disproportionate and dis, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And just, but I was still poor. But I never knew how she did it. But I used to complain because she wasn't there when she was out working. And, and in that moment, I, I began to think about how good she was, what she went through to get me what she got me and there's a phrase that we use children listen to this children are the best recorders of events they are the worst interpreters they are the best recorders of an event they're the worst interpreters they recorded the event that you wouldn't let them drive the car and they were heard about it they didn't record that they were only nine. And the wound is real, but it's not based on reality. And I, and I knelt there, and I, my heart broke because of where I was. But I had to see myself as a child. And I think the problem with the church today is that we think we're grown. And... If you compare yourself to someone who is the ancient of days, you're just a child. As it says, a child would be a hundred years old in that time. A child. So when people talk to me about how old they are, how mature, that brother right there, he's one of the pillars in the church. And I said, well, you know what a pillar is? I said, I said it doesn't move. Doesn't move. Pillars don't move. Tell somebody next week. Pillars don't move. So when we came through that time, it was such an amazing time for us, and God touched our lives deeply. And the thing that I said to the people, I said, I said, God has brought you someplace, and you need to be careful about that place. Um, and I want to share a passage of scripture with you. Uh, it's in the King James, but I'm not going to pronounce the Elizabethan words. I'm just going to say it, okay? It's in Psalm 66, verse 10 through 12. It says, For thou, O God, you have proved us, you have tried us as silver is tried, you brought us into the net, you laid affliction upon our loins, you caused men to ride over our heads, we went through fire and water. And then the psalmist says, but you brought us out into a wealthy place. King James is the only translation that has that phrase. You brought us out into a wealthy place. I want you to say to somebody, God's bringing you out into a wealthy place. Say it again. God's bringing you out into a wealthy place. And then I want to read a couple of the translations of of that phrase from the various translations. For instance, the Amplified Bible says, you cause men to ride over our heads when we were prostrate, when we went through fire and through water, but you brought us out into a broad, moist place to abundance and refreshment and the open air. 
Sounds like Houston. <laughs> Moist. A lot of moisture here. Another translation says, you let people run over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place where we have everything we need. Another translation says, you brought us out to rich fulfillment. Another one says, you brought us out to a spacious place. The new, new uh, says, but you brought us out into a wide open place. You led us out to freedom. And there's a translation that a friend of mine recommended that I read. And, and so I've been reading it and I've been enjoying it. And it's called the Passion Translation by uh, Brian, Brian Simmons. How many have heard of the Passion Translation? Oh, this is so good because on most churches when I say Passion Translation, I don't know the Passion Translation. Even Laura didn't even know the Passion Translation. But I'm going to order one for you. If you have a Kindle. Oh, then you got it coming. So the Passion Translation reads like this. Praise God, all you people. Go ahead and do that. Yes. All you people. And then it says, praise him everywhere and let everyone know you love him. There's no doubt about it. God holds our lives safely in his hands. He's the one who keeps us faithfully following him. Oh Lord, we have passed through. And here's the difference between all the other translations. Brian does not take it over here where somebody's doing something to us. So listen carefully. He says, oh Lord, we have passed through your fire. Like precious metal made pure, you've proved us perfected us and made us holy you've captured us ensnared us in your net then like prisoners you place chains around our necks you've allowed our enemies to prevail against us we've passed through fire and flood and then yet in the end you always bring us out better than we were before You always bring us out better than we were before. You always bring us out better. Always. Always. Barbara, who is my, my dream wife and my nightmare wife as well, um, she is as sweet as she can be. She's my, she's my number one intercessor, my number one adversary. I mean, it's just, I mean, she can be a whole lot of things all at one time. And, uh, and she's one of the funniest ladies you'll ever meet in your life. And, um, and we developed this saying, particularly after traveling for a lot. And thank you so much for the wonderful hotel that you put us in, Laura. And uh, it was as nice as it was the, the last time. And I'm just trying to figure out how I can get one of those pillows in my suitcase. Uh, <laughs> but I could have it. So... What we've learned is that, especially when, when, you, when we were traveling in the early days, um, before we could afford to stay in a hotel, whether the church could afford it or not, we stayed in a lot of places. And, and a lot of those places weren't nice. And so Barbara and I, we developed this saying, because we'd come home and we'd tell people about it and they would laugh. And so we said, it wasn't that funny when we were there. And so we developed this axiom. It goes like this. If it's going to be funny later, it's funny now. <laughs> you just have to see the funny in it. But if it's going to be funny later, it's funny now. And so we've, we've learned to laugh. We've learned to laugh. I've learned to laugh in my pain. Start to cry. Have you heard that song? Whenever I'm happy. Learning to dance in the rain, knowing that my troubles are just momentary. In the spirit he is real, in the spirit I can feel, in the spirit I am healed by the power of his love. But it's that one song, learning to dance in the rain, gonna start to cry whenever I'm happy. Yet in the end, 
always brings us out better than you were before. So when the psalmist in the King James translation says, but you brought us out into a wealthy place. Pastor from England was preaching in our church once. He was talking about that, that scripture, but God. Somebody say, but God. And he, was, and he said, there are a lot of great buts in the Bible. <laughs> and, and, and we all started laughing at him. He says, you Americans. But think about all the things that preceded the but. The net, the affliction, men riding over your heads, the refining, the fire, the, 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 all the things are going on. He says, what are you going through? Yes, but, but, but. We were coming out of, I won't, I won't tell the country because probably, there are probably some Jamaicans here. Um, <laughs> But we were coming out of Jamaica, and this lady was so rude to us. She was so rude, and, um, and, and she was demanding, and I was just getting irritated, and I hadn't heard my friend preach on not being offended and, um, until much later. And so my wife, my wife said to me, honey, come on. She said, come on, honey. If it's going to be funny later, it's going to be funny now. I said, this ain't going to be funny later. Just... This, it ain't going to be funny later. But you brought us out. But you brought us out. But you. Everybody say that. But you. Say that again. But you. There is NYU, New York University. There is BYU, Brigham Young University. There is CU, Carnegie University, and then there is But You University. And our task is to learn how to maintain and live in the holy place, in the wealthy place. And I want you to look at the text with me in the living, in that Passion Translation, how he says it. We've passed through your fire. It's God's fire. Like precious metal made pure, you proved us, perfected us. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, man, this, God, this doesn't sound right. This doesn't sound right. And you know what God said to me? He said, let me just, let me just show you one passage of scripture and, uh, and see if it sounds right now. Okay, so go to Psalm 105. And what I'm going to challenge you in your spare time, when you're just getting up and turning on CNN, the Clinton News Network, um, and filling your heart with all kinds of things that will depress you even more, um, read the Bible instead. I'm at Psalm 105. Are you there? Are you all breathing? Would you take a deep, deep, loud breath so I can hear it? Okay. I didn't say let it out. I just said take one. Just, all right. You're all going to get this in a while, all right? I'm in Psalm 105, verse 14. It says, he permitted no man to oppress them. He reproved kings for their sakes. Do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. He called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. Verse 17, read verse 17 with me, please. He sent a man before them. Joseph, stop right there. He sent a man before them. Stop right there. He sent a man before them. He sent a man before them. And then he says, as a slave. He was sold as a slave. He does not know. And the word sent, if you look at the word sent in the the Greek Old Testament, it would be the same as it is in the Greek New Testament. He's an apostle. Apostello. He's sent. 
he sent. He's an apostle. He has no idea that as an apostle, he's being sent as an apostle. He can't see apostle. All he can see is the butt of the camel that he's walking behind. Because, and but you, you get to look at a lot of butts. I'm not talking about camel behinds. I'm just saying butts. There, there are two ways to spell butt, all right? And, and I'm saying B-U-T. You can go wherever you want, but I'm, I'm, I'm camping right at B-U-T. He's sold. He is his daddy's favorite. Life is in front of him. He's got dreams. He's got, he's got ways of seeing things. God has spoken to him, and it's, he's, the, he's the son that Jacob always wanted, the one that, that his wife Rachel could never have. And then finally he comes, and, jo and Jacob just begins to dote on him. He gives him everything, and then God begins to dote on him. He starts to give him these incredible dreams. This first dream is he's dreaming of, uh, of wheat. And he says, we were in the field, you guys and me, and, and we were tying up our, our, our wheat and your sheaves bowed down to my sheaves. They didn't need anybody to interpret that dream. And they looked at Joseph and the Bible says, and they hated him because of his dream. Now when people hate you, when you tell them your destiny, and they hate you when you tell them stage one of your destiny. Don't tell them stage two. But he says, hey guys, what? I had another dream. Okay, what was it? Well, there was the sun and the moon and the stars, 12 stars and 11 stars and the sun and the moon were all bowing down to my star. And they hated him even more. And then one day they saw him coming. And here's what they said. Let's kill the dreamer and see what becomes of his dream. You tell people what your dream is. And if it looks like it's going to take advantage of them or encroach on them in any way, they're not going to kill the dream. They're going to kill you. And so they sold him into slavery. I was trying to see how I could fit that, that music into the message, but I, I couldn't, couldn't think of a way to do it. Verse 18, they afflicted his feet with fetters. He himself was laid in irons, sold as a slave, afflicted his feet with fetters, laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him until the time that his word came to pass came to pass the word of the Lord tested him it says then the king sent and released him the rulers of the people and set him free he made him lord of his house now listen to this please because it's a, it, it's so critical to us that when I'm looking at what God is doing in my life I can say he did it or I can say God you did it now, if God did it, then I've got a bad attitude toward God. God, why would you let them do something to me like that? Because my goal is to refine you, to prove you, to perfect you. Can I tell you something? May I tell you something? I said, may I say something to you? May I, may I just, okay. I need a response every now and then. If you are going to rule in government... And in government, there is all kinds of shenanigans, corruption, and everything else. If you're going to rule in that place, you need to be sure you handle your stuff at a lower level. So if you have a problem with women on this level, you will have a big problem with women on that level. And so when, the, when you are getting tested or refined, see, let me put it like this. When, the, when Satan tempts you, he doesn't know what you're going to do. He doesn't know what your response is. He really doesn't. All he knows is that under normal circumstances, the average person will do this. 
That's what he said to, to God about Job. He says, he says let, me, let me touch him. Let me touch him. He says, skin for skin, a man will do all that he can to save his own life. Now, he doesn't know what Job will do. He just knows what the average person will do. The average person, when they find a hundred dollar bill on the ground, will say, this is my lucky day. The average charismatic will say, God, I thank you, because I knew that seed that I, was, it would not occur to them somebody lost it. And they would say, well, did anybody lose a hundred dollars? And so if you want to test people about honesty, you don't put hundred dollar bills out, you put a dollar bill, stamps and things like that, just to see if people will take that. Because here's the deal, if people will take dimes, they will take dollars. And so he tests Joseph. How does he test him? He gives him a job and he works for Potiphar. And in Potiphar's house, God says, and the Lord was with Joseph. Isn't that amazing? He's a slave and God was with him. The Lord was with Joseph. The Tyndale translation, a real old translation says, and Joseph was a very lucky fellow. He sold into slavery. Joseph was a very lucky fellow. Joseph went to prison and Joseph was a very lucky fellow because luck in that day had nothing to do with chance. It had to do with favor. So he gets sold into the house of somebody who is wealthy and he gives him a job and he does well and he gives him another job and does well and everything he gives him he does well at it. He's, he's successful and he's making things happen and this man's, in fact, here's what the scripture says. He got so good at what he was doing, the only thing that Potiphar was concerned about was the food on his table. And then it goes on to say, Joseph was a nice looking guy. Now a person who is only concerned about the food on their table is probably not as nice looking as Joseph, whose mistress, Miss Potiphar, started looking at Joseph saying, Hey man, what you want to do today? Let's make something happen. And Joseph says, no, I, I don't do that. Oh, come on. Everybody in Egypt does this. He says, I can't do that. He says, I would dishonor God to do that. Come on. And she keeps pressing. And she keeps pressing. And then finally he, he runs. And she, she lies and says, he tried to rape me and, and, and the man who is only concerned about the food on this table, he, he says, put him in jail. Now, my suspicion, he knew his wife was lying. But he had to save face. So Joseph is in prison now. He's in prison with these dreams of ruling. I thought, I thought it was going to be with my dad. I, thought, I never thought I'd be walking behind a camel naked. No clothes on. On my way to Egypt to be sold. I am. I'm my daddy's. I'm. A, why is this all? Why is all this happening to me? And he's looking at all this and he's trying to figure out how did this take place? What goes on? And God, I don't understand this. And here's what. Here's what the word is saying. The word tested him. Not Potiphar. The word tests you. Your word, your prophetic word is going to test you. That prophetic word is going to prove you. It's going to refine you as silver is refined. Silver gets refined seven times in fire. It gets refined. God, I want to serve you. I want to do all that you have for me to do. I'll fight for you, God. I'll go through anything. And then you start to go through stuff. And you say, God, what's going on? He says, I'm just answering your prayer. I'm just... Just answering your prayer. God wrote a letter to his girlfriend. He says, I would, I would, I would fight wild lions for you. I would, I would, I would swim the deepest ocean. I would, and he, he laid out all these things. He says, and I'll be over tonight if it doesn't rain. And uh, it's like, we don't know what we're saying. And so when God starts to test us and when God starts to prove us and when God starts to refine us and when God starts to let men ride over us, we can't see that the end of it, and here's what I'm trying to get you to see, the end of all of that is to get you when it's done into the wealthy place. And I'll say it like this, 
the longer you are irritated and complaining about all the things that are going on in your life and blaming God, telling God, God didn't understand. You said you love me and we were singing that song. You're a good, good father. Who you are? You ain't good, God. I'm telling you right now. This ain't good. There ain't nothing good about this. And God is, he is so good. He just looks at you and just says, but you, because I know you're coming to this and you're in the middle of it and they're hurting your feet with fetters and they're pressing you and all kinds of things. And, and all of this happening and the Bible is still saying, and the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with, say it, the Lord was. Say it again, and the Lord was. He was with him. Jacob. Jacob goes to work for his mother's brother. He says, I'll work for seven years for that girl right there. I will work seven years. He says, for her? Yeah. He says, okay. And he says, at the end of seven years, he says, I'd like my, my pay. He says, yes. And in the morning, he wakes up and it's not who he worked for. He says, why did you do this? He says, well, it's not right to give the younger before the older. Work seven more years. <laughs> He's a good father. Amen. And he works 20 years. Laban changes his wages seven times. But in the middle of all of that changing, God says, hey, Jacob, let me show you a trick. Every time he changes your wages, you change how you feed them, how you water them. And if he says you're going to have the spotted and the ring steak, then that's what you put before those steaks. Make the steaks like what you want to see. I tell people when they say, I want a church that I can see every nation, every kind of thing in the congregation. I say, well, then put it on the platform. Amen. See, if you want an all black church, then put all black people on the platform. Amen. I, I think I said something. If you want a multiracial church, then put multiracial people on the platform. Because you reproduce after what you see. And so this reproduction is taking place. And Laban was saying, how is he doing that? Because I just changed his wages. And God says, you do this. He does that. You do this. And every time he does it, he changes. He changes. And at the end of the day, even though Laban has tried to rip him off and has ridden over him and has oppressed him, at the end of the day, he comes out better than he was before. Now, most of you would say, but Bishop, I don't have 20 years. Yes, you do. You got 20 years. You have a lot longer than you imagine. And, here she, and you need to walk it out with this, this phrase. God is always previous. God is always previous. And if you're studying scriptures, you'll look at certain things that are taking place and you will recognize there's a season that's coming. If all of this is going on, then God must be up to something in my life. When things increase, the more they persecuted them, the more they multiply. Kill them. Kill all those Egyptian babies. Kill them. Kill them. But the more they persecuted them, the more they multiply. The more they multiply. See, we, we look at the persecution. We just say, I don't understand. Huh? God, beam me up, Scotty. Just get me out of here. Stop the world. I want to get off. And God says, no, you got work to do down here. And you can't come home till you get your work done. But it's tough, God. They won't let us pray in school. They can't stop you from praying in school. One guy told me, he said, as long as there are examinations, there will be prayer in school. I'm... So you, look, you can't stop praying in school. I mean, you, look, you, you, may be, you may be able to say to me, you can't stand up on the stage and pray publicly, but I can sit out in the audience and I can say, and, and they don't know what I'm doing. See, so tell the person next to you, you have weapons that you haven't even used yet. 
And God's goal is to get me to a place where he can trust me with the more because I've proven to him that he can trust me with the little. So the day, the day Joseph says to Potiphar's wife, I don't do adultery. That's just not me. I don't do adultery. Now, you have to not do adultery at this level in order to not do adultery at that level. You have to not do corruption and graft at this level in order to not do it. Because if you're getting ready to be promoted to the highest place, second highest place in the world, you better have your integrity together. And how does God get your integrity together? Through the fire, through the rain, through the heat, through the storm, through his net. When he captures you, when he catches you and he pulls you in and says to you hey I'm doing I said God what are you doing I said why are all these people leaving me because they don't belong with you my wife and I we were building our church in the early days and and um, we were moving in deliverance ministry and a lot of churches weren't moving in deliverance ministry so people would come and they would bring their demonized family members to us and, uh, and, we, and we would cast the demons out. And, and we would baptize them. And, and amazing things were happening in these people's lives. And this one, this one family came and they said, my husband was peeking in windows and he's getting ready to go to jail. And he needs to deliver. So we brought him. And he got delivered and didn't go to jail. And the judge gave him off. And, and then he brought his, uh, his sister. She had a drug problem. And we were praying for her. And... Um, and, and as we're praying for her, she started doing like this. And, uh, and I said, Spirit, what is your name? And she said, it's r rock and roll. <laughs> now the Spirit said, rhythm, rhythm. I'm, I'm a spirit of rhythm. So where you go to church, mostly Baptist and Pentecostal. So, so... Uh, <laughs> So we get this whole family, it's, it's a whole family delivered. <coughs> I mean a whole family. And they're sitting on the front row and I'm looking at my wife. I said, our church, <laughs> our church is growing. It's growing. <coughs> Excuse me. This is what I was babbling. And, and I said, the church is growing. She said, yes. This family, after months of praying for them, <coughs> wrote us a note and said, we, we like your church, but there's one closer to where we live. And we're going to start going there. And I wanted to know, do they do deliverance? Do, do they do water baptisms? Do they do inner healing? And, and I was so angry. I was so angry. And God spoke to me. He said, did you do this for me or for you? I said, for me. I don't want to preach to empty pews. I just, I thought you were, he said, some are going to come and stay and some are not going to stay. You got to get satisfied that it's my church you're building, not your church. And you could minister and you could pour a whole lot into people. And I've, I found, and, 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 any pastors here? Any pastors? If you're a pastor, wave your hand. Okay. Here's what I found, pastors. I have found that when people get into trouble financially and you give them a large gift to help them get out of financial difficulty, they're not going to be with you long. Because I like this phrase, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> and God will sort you out with that kind of stuff. And he will refine you and he will prove you. And every now and then he'll, have, he'll come back and say, were you doing this for me or were you doing this for you? I guess kind of me. <laughs> yes. Guy came to our church. Wealthy guy. I mean wealthy. Wealthy guy. He was wealthy. He says, God wants us to start coming to your church. And I said, okay. Okay. Yes. Because people leave our church all the time and go to other churches, so isn't it only right that some people should come to our church from another church? Okay. 
But he left our church one, after one service, he and his wife, and he made the wrong turn, and the wrong turn took him down into the hood. He had no idea how close our church was to the hood. Didn't see him anymore. I said, God, what happened? He said, he's not yours. He's not yours. Refine you, purify you, test you, bring you through water, bring you through fire, let men ride over you. But in the end, he will always do you better than you were before. And so instead of looking at the process, look at the end. It's instead of saying, this is going to be funny later, you start laughing now. You start rejoicing now. You start praising God now. You start celebrating God now. You start telling him, you're a good, good dad. God, I don't see the end from the beginning. I have no idea how you're going to make all this work. I have no idea how all of this is going to turn out. But I know you are up to something. And I'm going to celebrate you because with all of these things going on, I have begun to see certain signals certain evidences, certain signs, certain seasons that tell me one season is over and a new season is beginning. And when you've been through as much as you think you have gone through and you wonder why you went through it in the first place, that's when you start singing. There's a break in, in my favor. There's a shifting in my direction. There's a breaking in my presence as I praise. And you start, you start walking that out and you just say, how's it going? Oh, there's a breaking. And you start declaring what God has in mind for you. You start saying it even, even if you don't see it. Something has to be declared. We say it like this at home. You got to say what you hear. So you can see what you said. You got to say what you hear. So you can. You got to say what you hear. So you can see what you said. You got to say what you hear. So you can see what you said. You got to say what you hear. See what I love about music and songs, you will sing something you won't pray. So God says, here, sing this, and you start singing this. But if he said, here, pray this, you say, mm, I don't feel led to pray that. So he, he does what the psalmist says, he surrounds you with songs of deliverance. And everywhere you turn, there's a song that is talking about your deliverance. And, and you say, I don't want to look at that way. And you look over here. And there's another song over here. He's, he's surrounding you with songs of deliverance. Say what you hear. Say what you hear. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. You got to say it. Something's breaking in my favor. You got to say it. Because if you don't say it, you won't see it. You gotta say it, you gotta say it, cause if you don't say it, you won't see it. You gotta say it, I gotta say it, I gotta say it in order to see it. Say it. Say it, see it. Gotta say it, gotta say it. What was Joseph doing in prison? He was not saying, I don't know what I did to deserve this. It was the word that he was focused on. That word tested him. 
that word refined him that word look I can't do that I can't do that with you because in my future I'm reigning over things and I can't give that up for this in my future I don't lie because I am leading a whole in my future I am going to help my family and while you can't understand why people can treat you the way they treat you and do the things to you that they do to you, you got to leave that alone because at the end of the day, but you brought us out into a place that was better than it was before. You brought us out into a wealthy place. Wealthy place. I had a dream that I was supposed to be in Pittsburgh. And I moved to Pittsburgh. The overseer of the church in the city must have had a dream that I didn't belong in Pittsburgh. So he put me out of the church. And I thought, this is awful. It is so awful. And, and I struggled with it and I battled with it. And then the Lord showed me something in the scriptures. And he, he helped me to see this. And, and so I'm, I'm battling with him because I need a word. There's no prophet around and there's nobody to tell me something. So I had, a, all I had was an amplified Bible. A brand new one I had never used before. And I'm looking at this amplified Bible. And I said, God, I need a word. And I know it's dangerous to open your Bible and get a word but I I was desperate and so I took this Bible and I said brand new Bible I didn't, I didn't want to use my Thompson chain reference Bible because it would always open to my favorite passages anyway I wanted one that wasn't programmed and I opened it I opened it and when I opened it it was Jeremiah 15 and Jeremiah 15 says your words were found, and I did eat them, and they were a joy and rejoice into my heart. I didn't meddle with those who were the merrymakers, and I didn't, I didn't do all those things. God, why will you be to me like a deceitful brook and like waters that fail and are uncertain? And I said, go, Jerry. <laughs> you know, if, if you can't say to things to God like you want to say them, Find a verse that says it for you. And then say that verse. Yes, that verse. That one right there. And I told God, I just said, yes, God, that's exactly how I feel. And, and then the Amplified goes on to say, if you will give up this mistaken tone of suspicion and unworthy suspicions concerning my faithfulness and if you will purify it in your own heart the pure from the vile then I will remove all this from you and do not return to the people let them return to you unworthy suspicions concerning my faithfulness and I'm telling you over the years that verse has come back to me in different ways and sometimes when God has moved me from some place where I think I'm supposed to be for the rest of my life and he says no you're only supposed to be for six months I said, why, God? Why? Why? This is, what I, this is my dream. He says, no, it's not your dream. I have the dream for you. And I moved from California back to Pittsburgh, California, Beverly Hills, swimming pools, movie stars. <laughs> Pittsburgh, cold, rainy, never sunshine. I mean, just, God, why did... I said, and he asked me the question, he says, in all of your experience in terms of the word, in all of your understanding of the redemption story, have you ever known any place where I failed anyone? And I said, no. He said, well, why would I start with you? What, what, what have you done that would make you believe that I am so angry with you that I'm messing you up right now? He says, I've got stuff for you, son. I've got stuff for you. And the, and the very thing that we struggle with is the stuff that we don't know God has for us because he's not telling you what he has for you. And he's saying, trust me. Trust me. Fire, rain, oppression, 
and into your net, your net, God. It wasn't somebody else's. I hooked you. I caught you. You didn't belong in California. You belong in Pittsburgh. That's where your destiny is. That's where your favor is. Now, if you want to move to Hawaii, you can, but the favor stays here. <laughs> God will give you a choice, but it won't be much. You miss that. What's my choice, God? Here in Pittsburgh, with me, with favor. Hawaii, without me, and without favor. What do you want? You know, you know what I want. I want, I want Hawaii with favor in you. You see, you can't have it. What else do you want? And I was like that guy that fell off the roof. He actually didn't fall off the roof. He slipped off and he was hanging on to the, to the rail, the gutter. And nobody could hear him. The guy next door was cutting the grass and they couldn't hear him screaming. And so finally he said, is there anybody who can help me? Nobody. So he looks up like this. He says, is there anybody up there who can help me? And, and this big voice spoke out of heaven says, believe and let go. Is there anybody else up there who can, who can help me? Same thing. So here I am, and I'm saying to our guys, you have to stay in the wealthy place. Now let me just close with this. I have three closes. <clears throat> and... I want you to look at Matthew 18 with me, please. Matthew 18. Verse 1, it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's their question. How does Jesus respond? Whatever translation you have, just read it with me, please. He called a child to himself and set him before them and said, everybody read verse 3. Come on. Everybody. Do you, you have Bibles here? Okay. Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such a child in my name receives me. So I'm looking at this, this passage in this Passion Translation. Here's what it says. Jesus called a toddler to his side and said to him, said to them, learn this well unless you dramatically change your way of thinking and become teachable and learn about heaven's kingdom realm with the wide-eyed wonder of a child you will never be able to enter in now say this please becoming is a process say it again becoming it's a process. And here's the new paradigm for you. Growing up in the kingdom isn't really growing up. It's growing down. They have this expression in Jamaica, small up yourself. Small up yourself. And that when you get to a place that you just think you know it all and you have it all, small up yourself. It's just a God, I don't know. I, I approach the scriptures like this. I just say, Jesus, I've read this, uh, I don't know how many times, but... I don't know anything about it. What can you show me that I missed? And that's when you see stuff. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally and he doesn't rebuke you for it. In fact, in this age, you don't even just have to ask for it. You can ask God, I want a spirit of wisdom. Because that's what Joseph had. When Pharaoh looked at him, Joseph, here's what Joseph did. Joseph described, he gave Pharaoh his job description. When he's finished, he says, let Pharaoh choose this, this, and this, and this, and this. And Pharaoh looked around, he says, I don't see anybody like that but you. Childlike wisdom, approaching God as though you're a child. The, the, 
the psalmist says, like a weaned child resting on his mother's bosom. He says, I don't bother myself with things that are too high for me. No baby nursing stops and says, did you find out what the Dow Jones was today? Just, they don't care. You shouldn't care. If God has it all in control, then you got to say, God, I'm just leaning on Jesus. Leaning on him. And here you say, childlike, I need some kids. I need children. I need children. I need people who understand that I'm a father. And so in that prayer when he's teaching us, because until you understand that you are going to go through some hard places and they're designed to do stuff for you and to you. God isn't keeping stuff from you. He's keeping stuff for you, but he can't give it to you until you are mature enough in a childlike way to handle it. For me, for me, one of my friends, his son wanted a bicycle for Christmas. And his dad said, I don't know if I can get you that bicycle. But when he came downstairs Christmas morning and saw that bicycle, that boy looked at that bicycle. He ran up the stairs, ran down the stairs, did flips over the couch for me and did the same thing all over again. It was amazing. I'm, and I'm saying, God, what happened to the childlike stuff that we have? We are, we're so mature. Yes, we're so mature. We look God. We look God. And God is saying, come on, get out, man. Just, how you doing? I'm doing good. My kids understand. When I come home to my grandkids and they say, where you been, Pop? I said, I was in Africa. Did you have a good time? Yes. Did you miss me? Yes, I missed you. You know what, Max? What'd you bring me? bring me? If you really missed me, you were thinking about me. And if you were thinking about me, you got something. I know you got something. Because that's the childlike attitude. You ought to come into the house of worship, particularly after you've been refined and beat up on by all the other stuff that God intends to use to get you to the wealthy place. When you get here, guys, you got, I know you got something good for me. I know you got, I'm no longer a child, a slave to fear, but I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave. I love that song. And then when you get that part, you split the sea so I can walk right through it. He's still doing that. And when you come to, it's like when you come to this, this dead end, it looks like a dead end. You got to say, there is a wall here. There is a door here, but I just don't know where it is. God, could you tell me where the door is? Where's the door? Be childlike. Don't stand there and say, I bind you, devil. You lying wonder you. I know there's a door right in here. No, no, no. Just say, God. <laughs> I've been there. I took our whole church out on Saturday. Years and years ago, I was walking in faith. And, they, the, and the weather report says it's going to rain. I said, we rebuke that. We bind up the clouds. You cannot rain. It's, it started to drip. And I said, I rebuke you. My, my wife said, honey, it's raining. I said, no, no negative confessions are here. Just... Water started pouring down. My kids were eating. Beans were floating in the water on their... And they looked at their mother. Mother, what are we going to do? And she said, talk to your daddy. And she started to sing this song, Laura. I can't wait till I get you home. Now, in my moment of wanting to believe something, I just hadn't come to it. I couldn't stop it. Maybe I hadn't gotten on my knees enough. But there are things that God wants you to know you can have because you are his child. I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I'm a child of God. And so if you're walking through a really tough place, you're walking through that place and you're saying to God, it's scary in here. He said, I know for you, I'm not scared. He said, are you with me? And then when a friend of mine told me, he said, he said, I'm no longer a slave to fear is number three on Justin Bieber's playlist. I said, really? And then, Laura, they started to tell me the story that in Toronto, at Catch the Fire, 
there was a youth conference and Justin wanted to go. His mother said, I don't have the money. So he went out on the street with his guitar and he played and, and made enough money to pay for his registration to go to the conference. At the conference, prophets took him, put him on their shoulder and began to prophesy how he was going to change and affect a whole generation. Now, nobody's going to tell you that story, but I don't know where Justin is, but I, I think he's gone through some fire and he's being tested and people are riding over him, but I'm looking at that, the end of that verse, it says, but in the end, but in the end, he's going to bring him out into a wealthy place. God wants to bring you out into a wealthy place. Bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit, you are God's answer for every one of us. You are the evidence of our inheritance. You are the earnest of the inheritance that's yet to come. And if you, Holy Spirit, are just a deposit of an inheritance that we have, we can't imagine what the inheritance is how great it is, how awesome it is. And so as we sang, you're in us, you are in us. And as one translation says, you're in us helping us to want to obey you and then helping us to do it. You are helping us to desire to obey you. And then you are helping us to obey you. We're not on our own. We have this amazing grace that you have entrusted to us. It's substantive, it's, it's vibrant. It, it's not a grace that allows me to be reckless with what you've entrusted to me, but it's a grace that holds on to me. It's a grace that makes a declaration, shall I continue in sin, that grace might increase all the more, God forbid. This grace was not given to us to dissipate in all kinds of foolishness, but to sustain us in this season that you've called us to. I want to be like you. I want to be like you, oh Lord. I want to be like you. I want to be like you. I want to be like you, oh Lord. I want to be like Sing that with me. I want to be like you. I want to be like you. Oh, Lord. I want to be like you. I want to be like you. I want to be like you. walk like you. I want to walk like you. I want to walk like you. Oh Lord. I want to walk like you. I want to walk like you. over us. You 
refined us. You tested us. You proved us. When I, I think about those verses, there, there are all kinds of stories in the scripture that come to me. And one of the stories is the story of Hannah, the mother of Samuel, whose husband had two wives, one too many. And the wife that was not Hannah was, she could, she could have babies and, but Hannah couldn't have any. And here's what the Bible says, because the Lord had closed her womb. Say that, the Lord had closed her. Why would he do that? Because he's waiting for a season in her life when she is ready to give God what God wants. There is something that heaven wants to get into earth. And he needs somebody in earth to respond to him. And it's in her season of desperation, in her season of refinement, in her season of brokenness, in her season of torment, that she comes to Shiloh and she's praying. And she says these words to God, I am so desperate to have a baby that God if you just give me a son just give me a son I'll give him back to you I'll give him back to you and Eli saw her praying and all he could do was see her lips moving and so his thinking is that she's drunk and so he says how long are you going to do that put away drunkenness she says oh no 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 this, this is this is heaviness of heart. I'm hurting. And then he said, the Lord grant me your petition. He didn't even know what he was saying. But because he was the priest, he could say something. And she went home. And she had a baby boy. And she named him Samuel. God's name. Samuel. El. Psalm. God. Name. God. Name God. Samuel, name God. And when her season of weaning him was over, the Bible says she brought him to Eli and said, I promise this boy to God. I believe that God wanted to get, he wanted to get a prophet into earth, but he needed someone desperate enough to say, I'll give him to you. I believe God's waiting for people who will say, God, I will give you what you want in order to get what you want into the earth. I'll give you what you want. And she doesn't even know God wants it. She just knows I want it. What is that? What is that about when your desire and God's desire comes together and it produces something? Like someone who will say, and his words never fell to the ground. And then you know what? I said like this. She didn't know that she was giving God her first child. She just knew it was her only child. I'll give him to you. But you can't be God giving. You just can't. And so God says, okay, you gave me one. You just wanted a boy, but I'm gonna give you three boys. And I'm gonna give you two girls, five for one. What is there about this God you and I serve that just simply says, I'm not going to let you beat me. I'm just, I'm just, I don't, I don't care what you give me. You are not going to beat me giving you. I'm just telling you right now, you can give whatever you want, but I'm telling you. She gave her first. Would you say that please? She gave her first. What, what about the widow, the, the Zarephath widow who who was hungry and she said to Elijah, I, I'm going to eat it and die. And he says, 
she, she says, because this is all we have left. It's our last. And he says, you know what he says? He says, give it to me first. He says, I promise you, even though you don't have, there will be meal and oil in the barrel. As long as there is a famine, you will not. And she looked at him like he must have been crazy, but she did it. She did it. When she did it, she's watching him eat. He says, go, go fix yourself something. I gave you the, I gave you everything. He says, go, go. And there's meal and there's oil. Meal and there's oil. The great part of that story for me is not that she gave meal and oil, but she made room in her house for a prophet to take care of a issue that was going to emerge. As I said, God's previous. God's previous. Say that, God's previous. God's previous. And so what he wants to do is situate something in your house by way of generosity, by way of a gift, so that when the season comes and you need somebody in your house who can raise a dead baby, you've paid the price because you gave him your last. You gave him your last. And then there's that, that widow who's, who takes her two mites and puts them in the offering. You remember the story. And Jesus is watching all these people. Look at somebody say, Jesus is watching. He's watching all these people drop in bags of money. And he sees her coming. She puts in these, these two mites. And he turns to his disciples. He says, she's given more. And so how, how can she give more? They have given out of their abundance. She has given her all. If you serve God long enough, before you get to the wealthy place, and in order to stay there, you're going to be somebody who gave him your first, your last, and your all. I look at, at a ministry like this, and I say, God... There should be a thousand people here. There should be more than a thousand. I don't know what it could see, but there should be people here. Because what is here is this 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 ain't this ain't a cult. This this is a place where God, are you getting us ready for what you already have ready for us? Yes. Is this about you? Is there something that we need to do to say to the world around us? You may be hungry, you may be thirsty, but there's something that God wants. And I'm saying to you, in order for us to make it happen, some of us are going to have to say, God, if this is all I have, you can have it. If this is the last that I have, you can have it. If this is the first that I have, you can have it. I believe the culture of generosity marks the church. And there's a statement that I found in the scriptures, and I'll say it like this. When people say, you know, I'm trying to get a business going. And I say, well, I said, sow a seed. And I said, well, how's that going to change anything? I said, have you read the scripture? Your gift will make room for you. Your gift will make room for you. You're trying to start a business, and you're trying to get a, you're trying to get a contract. Sow a seed. Give towards that. Target the things. That, and, and begin to understand that God didn't put those stories in the Bible just to say, ain't I bad? He put them in the story so that we could learn from them and begin to respond. Tonight, I want us, I want us to receive an offering that will match the atmosphere. We're generous in our worship, generous in our praise. Do we have envelopes? We have envelopes. Houston, we have envelopes. <laughs> and before you write anything, before you say anything, I want you to think, God, what can I do that could even come close to matching Hannah's gift? What can I do that could come close to matching the widow of Zarephath? Hannah got five for one. Say five for one. Zarephath, well, she got a miracle and, and, and ate for three and a half years. We don't know. 
what the widow who gave her all. We don't know what she got. All we know is that she can't be God given. And what she gave, first of all, got God's attention. Give something that will get his attention. That will say to, to Jesus, hey Jesus, I'm sowing into this ministry. Checks made payable to Celebration Ministries. Okay, can I have one of those envelopes? Because <clears throat> I want to give. Is there a Terry Oliver here? If she were, she would have responded, I promise you. Can I have the dancers? Those of you who are dancing, can you come back up here, please? Credit card, checks, cash. Thousand is spelled T H O U S A N D. Just right here, just right in front of me. Are y'all related? Hmm? No, not sisters. Do you like each other? Okay, I think I, I thought I could tell that. Well, I get to see a lot of ministry, and um, some of it is just people having a good time spinning around and doing things. But um, I just turned to Clarence, and I just said, I said, they're good. Yeah. Are you all, you all have an envelope? Everybody have an envelope? If you don't have an envelope, you should have an envelope. Even if you don't, if you think you don't have anything to put in it, take one anyway. So everybody should have an envelope. Just no pressure, just pressure. Okay. Were you here two years ago? Were you guys dancing here two years ago? Who, all of you? Okay, because you guys were probably too young to be here two years ago, right? Some people just to come and stand behind them, please. Just, uh, I want you to put your, just do your hands like, like you're getting ready to get something. There's a process in impartation called, Pastor John, could you come up here with me, please? There's a process in impartation called giving and receiving. Giving and receiving. Um, I can give, but you still have to receive. And I believe this is a season that God wants to put something in you. Isaiah 65 says, the new wine is in the cluster. That God is going to increase the level of anointing in this group there will be a cluster anointing that that something is going to be birthed in this weekend that you have been wanting to see there's a vision that has been exploding in you and you've been trying to find a room for it you've been trying to find a place for it to be expressed and and god is saying to you this is the time this is this is the season and that song that we were singing earlier there's a breaking in your favor there's a shifting in your direction 
God cannot ignore the kind of passionate praise that you bring to him. It's, it's unlike him. You attract his attention. The Holy Spirit come. Multiply. Multiply what you have already given them. Increase even more. Let it come. 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 No limits. No measures. I see increase. All around you break for stretch for release 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 here it comes 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 such a creative deposit such a heart for God God is going to entrust to you a spirit of abandonment. And wonder. Creative expressions, creative ways that God is going to use you. It will be as though you've already heard the song, the song of the Lord, and yet you will perform as though you've rehearsed it because it will be the Holy Spirit bringing it together. When I say to one, I say to all, this is your time. This is your time. This is your time. Thank you, Jesus. God's given you a burning heart for him. Break her wide open for you, God. Break her heart for you. Let her surrender everything. And with childlike wonder, let her discover the fresh new things that heaven has. Who? Go deep, go deep. all of you to do something for me. Um, and I'm, I'm going to step back because you know, I, want you to, I want you to lift your voice. Okay. And all you need to say, they don't have to stand, they can, they're okay. Here's the rehearsal. I want it all. Just say that. I want it all. Just say it again. Together. Okay, now that's the way, that's, that's what you're going to say. That's not how you're going to say it. Okay, I want you to, I want you to yell like God's deaf. See, the, the blind man, when they told him to shut up, they said, shut up. And he said to them, isn't he the guy that's opening blinded eyes? They said, yes. Well, can you open my eyes? And they said, no. He said, well, he can. And I'm trying to get his attention and not yours. All right. Okay. So you want his attention. All right. So say, I want it all. Just sit together. Come on. I, I want it all. No, not yell yet. Just, you're just rehearsing. I want it all. I want it all. Together. You know how you all coordinate when you're dancing? 
you know. Let's see if we can do it when you say it, all right, the same way. Same time, on three. One, two, three. I want it all. There you go. Pronounce the T. Okay, I want it all. All right, come on. I want it all. All right, all right on three. You ready? You want to rehearse it again? Okay, you got it? All right. How long does it take when you rehearse your, your, uh, your routines? How long does it take for you to get it? Just depends on the routine. All right. There, there is an acceleration that's coming to your ministry that God's going to bring to you. What was hard won't be hard any longer. What was complicated is going to come simple because God's going to teach you something fresh, something new. And people are going to come to you saying, will you teach us what God has taught you? So get ready to be crowded, all right? On three, you got to yell now. If I don't hear the yell, I'm going to ask you to do it again, all right? One, two, three. Join them, all right? Would you stand, please? God has more for you than you can imagine. Are you ready to give? I was in a church service, and I said, if you don't have anything, give a button. And the guy cut a button off of his jacket, and within two weeks he had the best job he'd ever had he'd been out of work for I don't know how long God doesn't ignore your gift all right do this take your envelope don't put it in yet no who asked you to do that come on you got your envelope if you don't have your envelope and they took it from you just wave it wave your hand that had an envelope in it and I want you to scream just like they did and you joined them now you got to leave them in there on three I want it all come on one Two, three. I, want it all. I, I, don't, I don't think that was right. That, that wasn't quite there. That didn't break the glass plane. Okay. On three. Come on. One, two, three. I, I want it all. All right. Just. Hold the all. Okay, don't say, I want it all. Just hold that all. Be childlike. Okay. Small up yourself. Someone said it like this. We don't grow old. We don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. All right. Have some fun in the house of God. Are you ready? No, I said, are you ready? I said, are you ready? Come on, hold your envelope. Hold your hand up. I want it all. I want it all.